righty, everybody. Good evening or good afternoon. Welcome to a special edition of Shy Panther and Friends. Our recording time today uh, was scheduled for 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, but we couldn't get on the live, so we decided to go ahead and pre-record. All righty. So uh, this is Shy Panther and Friends as show. <laughs> I'm a little bit thrown off because things didn't go as planned. It's Friday, September 25th. And we normally air on Thursday evenings, but we do have special editions in case people can't make that evening hour. All right, so we have Taylor Amari Banks here with us. I am your host, Gail. And the, the whole uh, goal of the show, the mission, is to provide quality programming. And we, um, our goal is to uplift, to empower, and to educate. And I hope that that is what we've been doing so far. If this is your first time checking out Shy Panther and Friends, please go to our website at shypanthermediagroup.org and leave your email so that you can keep up with the show. Also, you can email me at, um, email the show at shypantherandfriendsshow with the number one at gmail.com. All right. Plus, I want to offer that there are many ways to support the show, and that can be sharing the page, um, liking the page, telling people about what's going on and when the shows air, you can uh, just chat with us, talk to, talk with our guests and ask questions and that helps us a lot. It helps us to get to be, to become more popular and known uh, so that we can grow our audience, obviously. All righty, so Ms. Taylor Amari Banks, welcome, welcome, welcome. And our, our topic today, we're going to be talking about um, the, the role of a doula and um, working with a doula and why it's important to do that. And we'll be talking about um, the importance of having, of, of breastfeeding your babies and having an expert to come and help you with that. So first off, what is a doula? Because I'm from the old school and I don't know too much about it. And for us, it was, it was midwives and things like that, but we didn't know much about doula. So, so is there a difference between the two? There's definitely a difference. So I think everyone has their place. Um, midwives are hand, more hands-on as far as um, the actual birth. So the um, role of a midwife would be to everything from a medical standpoint. Okay. The role of a doula would be everything from a non-medical standpoint. Um, so support, um, information, um, you know, positional help, um, kind of specifically based on the mom, everything that the mom needs. Okay. As opposed to, <laughs> uh, as opposed to caring for the uh, unborn baby. Your whole focus is on the mother. Mostly, yes. Okay. So uh, during pregnancy, it would be offering support in whatever way she needs, um, offering advice, offering information, kind of walking her through, um, you know, different steps to help her be successful during the birth, um, you know, and whatever she needs. During the birth, it would be encouragement. It would be making sure um, her birth plan is followed through on, supporting the doctor or midwife in whatever way we can. Um, yeah, and postpartum, it would be supporting the mother in any way she needs nutrition, um, help with baby sleeping, breastfeeding. Um, you know, it, it ranges. So uh, it's centered around the mother, whatever she needs. Okay, so it's full, it's like total support, uh, wholesome, yeah, uh, of, of the mother, um, exactly. Okay, so why, why did you want to be a doula? I mean, what, what was the draw? What was the thing that got you up and said, I'm gonna go ahead and enroll? And how do you become a doula? So, the pool for me was, I think. After I had my first child, um, I think that the biggest, what happens is, you know, typically you go to the hospital or even if you have a home birth, 
you, you know, you go through this kind of huge change. And when you get home, there's no more support. Um, you might have family that's there temporarily. Um, and everybody's like, let's hold the baby, hold the baby and kind of forget about mom. Yeah. Um, I think that was my biggest draw to becoming a doula, even I think within birth, not having that proper support or everyone around you not knowing exactly how to support you um, while giving birth or during pregnancy or postpartum because there's, you know, multiple different types of doulas. You have, um, you know, pregnancy, you have birth and you have postpartum, three different stages. Okay. And um, I think that's the biggest draw for me. It was having a child and kind of just feeling alone, like, okay, um, my husband, he has to go back to work. He only gets to stay home for so long. Um, my parents, my grandparents, you know, they came along, but when everyone's gone, they have to go back to their normal lives. Right. Right. And that healing still has to happen. Right. So, yeah, that was the biggest draw for me. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was 100 years ago <laughs> when mm -hmm. I had my child, <laughs> your uncle, um, but I had the same feeling that you have. And I, um, even though back then they did have some uh, prenatal classes, but mm -hmm. I'm almost certain, I didn't go to them, but I'm almost certain that they didn't go into detail about what you're talking about and right it's kind of like to me what you described you, you're helping me uh learn how to become a mother and mm -hmm. like the very hands-on how how to take care of your baby and some of the things that that you can expect that, um, change to your body and and there are a lot of things that like the growth the uh what do you call it the uh, stages that you should expect the baby to go through and um, I think a lot, well, new mothers don't know if they, they just couldn't know unless you, you've uh, been pregnant before and you've given birth. And the part about that, that feeling of alone, being alone, that's, to me, that's very, very serious because it, you're exhausted. You're exhausted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you never. The transition, the transition is tough. You think that you do everything to prepare beforehand. Okay, I've researched stuff, I've done this, I've done that, but there's nothing that can prepare you for motherhood other than motherhood. Okay. Um, that's kind of the biggest thing. We have like this misconception. I feel like everything that I researched before actually having children did not matter, not one bit. Oh. Nothing could prepare me for it. Yes. <laughs> Truthfully, yes, because we research all the things that does not matter. I mean, literally, I thought I was just so well-versed. I had a daycare. I'm like, I've been around kids forever. I got this, you know? Right. No, no. <laughs> Actually having children <laughs> is what prepared me and what started me into researching the things that actually matter. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So when you, okay, that was my question too. When you said that you support the mother during her pregnancy um and and so how often do you interact with with uh expected mom so it's going to depend on the type of doula that you are so what i am going to be is a birth and bereavement doula so and you know what i'll be doing as far as interaction okay say you said what i'm sorry say that again what are you going to be a birth and bereavement doula Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, interaction kind of varies um, about kind of on what you what you offer as far as um, you. It varies from person to person. My interaction, I prefer to do monthly monthly check ins. Um, whereas you have other doulas that'll say, oh, um, during pregnancy you only need to interact maybe a couple of times. Um, for me, I like to kind of build that relationship since I'm going to be the one assisting and um, supporting you in your birth. Right. Um, so that's me as far as interaction goes. Okay. Um, I, was, I did uh, research a little bit 
and it does mm -hmm. stand out um, that you do those work with the needs of the mom and kind of like sometimes up to the point of the, the role of the family, I guess, and what they, mm -hmm. they expect or what they, yeah, expect to happen. Um, kind of like what you were saying, how they were planning things to, to roll out and, and mm -hmm. reality that might not be reality because, you know, every day could be different when you're, when you're caring mm -hmm. Because we're human beings, we're not machines. We're not going to work according to something that's written in black and white. Um, but there, exactly. Yeah, and we have common things that that we can expect to see, but a lot of things won't go as planned. So, um, so how do people find a doula if they want an, a doula? So, depending on your location, typically there is a doula network in your area that you could just you know, do a Google search or even um, search locally on Facebook. Um, but most, most of the doulas in your area are going to be on that doula network or um, easily searched on Google. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. They're pretty accessible. I think people just, you know, are still learning about them yeah. and that they're available. Yeah. And I think, I guess maybe for me, it's the concept of when you say doula, because I have, I'm not familiar with the word, but, but yeah. of course I'm familiar with what you do. And actually, I love that idea that you, you don't do the medical stuff. You support the mom. I think that's, I think that's great because I know at, at, I had David just before I turned 21, I needed all of what you just said. I needed it and yeah. I didn't have it. So I just was praying a lot and, you know, trying to pay attention a lot. And there's so, to me, there were so many things like I didn't know how to balance caring for the baby and caring for myself and doing anything else in the house. So I just took care of the baby and I didn't really do anything else. And I would get to a shower when I could get to it. I barely cleaned anything. I just made sure it was livable. And I, I did move back with my mom for a little while because I knew that it was going to be overwhelming. That part I did know. But as you said, for the most part, everybody gets back out to work or whatever they have to do. So it's real important that you have some kind of support system. Yes, and I think that that's important. Um, as a doula, I also think it's important to kind of walk the family through the proper way to help a mother. You know, um, the last thing that a newborn needs is to be stripped from its mother's arms. So instead of saying, hey, let me hold the baby, how about, hey, let me clean up. Hey, let me get you food. Hey, um, can I run errands for you? Um, you know, and if it is holding the baby, hey, go get a shower. I noticed you haven't taken a shower today. Let me go ahead and hold and, um, you know, you do a feeding and I'll go ahead and hold baby and take care of baby so that you can get a shower and just get some sleep. Right. You and know, those things go a long way in postpartum care. Okay. And, you know, um, I hadn't thought about, I mean, there's a lot. I, it's just been so long. But, um, yeah, that would have, I would have loved that. But at the time, at back then, um, you, you were criticized. If you couldn't clean up and you couldn't cook, and why is the house looking like this? And why and it's like, are you are you serious? Yeah, they expected you to be able to do all of it, and that's just unreasonable. And it, just as you said, it's unreasonable, and it's also sad because when you look at our statistics health wise, mm -hmm. we're the ones doing worse. We're the ones, um, and people that look like us are the ones who are you know, unfortunately passing away during childbirth and, po and early postpartum. It's essential that we're taking care of ourselves now more than ever. It's important. Okay. And I think that uh, plays a large role in that. Okay. Um, you said early postpartum. So you mean like a year or so after, after the, not even a year, after giving birth? Directly after birth, within the first couple of weeks after birth. Um, that's when issues present itself. Wow. 
Um, yes, it's important. It's important. Self-care is very important during early postpartum. Okay. Now, for me, um, I've, I've heard of, I've seen in the news and read in magazines about women, women who, like, immediately after giving birth, pass away. Some of them get into extreme distress while giving birth and they pass away. Mm -hmm. And um, just, just the quality of care of women of color is, is in, in, uh, while in pregnancy is really, really bad. It's very, it's disgraceful. Um, mm -hmm. It really is. And I, let me see if I can find it really quick. I was trying to find the statistics, but you probably know them right off the top of your head. Um, it was saying that, I know I was reading a, a CDC was talking about uh, most, uh, what do you, uh, ah, trying to think of the word, but most pregnancy related deaths are preventable. And it didn't matter whether we had a college degree, it, all of these uh, things that you would think could make the difference for us did not make the difference for us. Um, and it was, they were saying that for black women with at least a college degree, well, five to 5.2 times, uh, I guess the, the, the mortality rate of white counterparts. That's unbelievable. And, it, and they were talking about- it's, But when you are in these hospitals frequently as a pregnant mother, early postpartum mother, or just a mother in general, it's very believable because you have so many instances where we are literally just not listened to. And when you're in such a vulnerable state to where you cannot advocate for yourself, it right. is important that your family and, you know, if you have, if you choose to get a doula, which I, I firmly believe that everyone needs doulas, um, if you choose to do that, they're advocating for you and they know that they're, they know your wishes, your birth plan has been going over um, front and back multiple times so that your wishes are followed through on because you know, I've had two births and I, you know, I'm working on my third one. Um, I've had multiple instances in hospitals where I was ignored. And if I had had a doula there to advocate for me, or I had even prepared my family more, mm -hmm. um, my wishes could have been better followed through on. Okay. Um, that, Something you just said, um, I remember too, you know, it was a hundred years ago, um, why <laughs> <laughs> in delivery, um, it was like, it was, it's, it's, the thing was, once you get going to the delivery room, you don't want to stay in there a long time. You, you, hopefully you can go ahead and give birth without any complication, without any medical interference, without them trying to do anything. And I remember um, before I had David, I used to see little kids with these indentations on their heads where the doctors use forceps to, to help mm -hmm. pull the baby out. And it left marks. It left that forever. And at the point, I had gotten to the point where it seemed like the baby was coming along and then it stopped. And then I saw them like talking to each other and saying what they were going to do. And then I heard one resident say, well, the attendant said, call him. If something happens, you have to do something different. And then one of them was like, no, we can do it. And I was like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can push, I can get them out. And I did. And I, I, I cause I saw them, they wanted to use those forceps. And I, and I remember, I thought so many times before I get in here, I'm going to remember mm -hmm. not put those forceps on my baby. Let me get him out. Mm -hmm. And they didn't think about doing any type of, cesarean or anything like that the first thing they thought well let's put this you know I you know I was like thank you Lord that I did not let them touch him with those damn forceps <laughs> I mean and it's just like you said it's you it's and them. so many in, in so many issues right now even you brought up cesarean the rate of cesareans just scheduled cesareans for no reason no medical reason at all whatsoever to hurry up alone basically the rate of induction to hurry things up alone for no reason it's ridiculous you know there are instances where certain things are necessary i'm not saying there isn't but it's not commonly necessary 
Okay. Most of the time, you can do it. Yeah. Most yeah. of the time, you can do it. Yeah, because I'm and, so serious about that. I'm like, and then I thought, too, I had nobody was there for me. It was just me and the, those two residents. Right. And just imagine in the event of anything, anything at all, you have nobody there to advocate for you. Right. That's a yeah, that's that's you know we a huge problem. So does insurance do um I don't know. I would guess insurance policies depending, right? Would they pay for doulas, you think? So mostly no, they don't. Okay. Um doulas are typically an out of pocket out of pocket cost, but um, you know, there's there's many ways to prepare for the out of pocket cost of a doula. Um, I think that it's important to start researching and looking into it at the beginning of your pregnancy and, um, you know, preparing for it, figuring out those costs and preparing for it. You have pl plenty of local doulas that are just now getting in or um, have been in that are willing to work with you on payment plans um, or some that are willing to go pro bono. So, um I still think that it's important to kind of look into it and figure out your options. Okay. Okay. So, well, that brings us to, well, you know what, to, um, we got to, I think it's important too, that we touch on advocating for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. just talk about that. Um, because I, I mean, just from experience, I've noticed that, from what you said, the doctors don't listen to us. Medical providers don't really listen to us a lot of times. And, um, and, and, and I, I grew up in a culture where you listened to or you, you took what the doctor said and you didn't question it. But I, I believe that even, even if they give you medication, you should know why you're taking that medication. You should know what the side effects could possibly be. You should know your options. And talk about um, advocating for yourself as a young person, especially a young person of color, a black lady. It's truly important, especially if you're young. I think the younger people and the older people, you definitely have to have somebody standing in for you or you have to be able to advocate for yourself because you will be mishandled. Mm -hmm. You definitely will. So if you can- so you said something important. Um, the younger and the older generation, the ones who it can be slightly harder to advocate for yourself. It's important to learn how to advocate for yourself. And um, that includes looking up your local state laws, first off, and knowing what is legal and what is illegal in the first place. Um, that's super important. Knowing your stuff is super important. Um, when when people say um in, in my time it was common to just kind of go along with whatever the doctor said if they said you need this or take this mm -hmm. we went right along with it well i always bring up that medical misdiagnosis is the second leading cause of death in the united states and that's of all races so imagine how it is for us yes exactly now let us think you know so you could question everything they say okay you should do your research, you know, um, research every drug, research every procedure, research um, alternatives, research natural alternatives, research, um, you know, get second opinion. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately make the decision about what you feel is best for your health out of all of those options. Yeah. And go from there, you know? Mm hmm Yes, this is good. This is, these are great recommendations. Um, know the state laws, what, know what's legal. Um, remember that you said medical misdiagnosis is the number two cause of death in the United States. For any, right behind heart. Behind, mm -hmm. behind heart disease, okay. And you said to do your research, Google, um, research medication, research any of it and get second opinions, okay. Now, um, now this, 
I think is a natural transition into uh, your certified um, lactation specialist role because th this is one of the roles that you play in postpartum is what you were talking about mm -hmm. things and um i know oh my goodness i wanted to breastfeed so bad but i just could not imagine it it just seemed like i couldn't keep up i couldn't even like find time to take a bath so i definitely mm -hmm. imagine being prepared to feed a baby um i just couldn't <laughs> because I, my main concern would be this child is never going to get enough to eat because I can't, I'm not, I'm not prepared to do something like that, I guess. And you know what, as a breastfeeding mother, I've now been breastfeeding for almost two years. Um, for me, that's, that's kind of funny because that's the way that you do get sleep. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm not, no. <laughs> breastfeeding just because it's natural that does not always mean it's easy it can be tough it can require work okay i'm not going to say that it's always a walk in a park but it's so um i don't want to say simple <laughs> it's not simple it's not like i said it's almost not always simple but in comparison to formula feeding all those things that you just named Okay. Imagine being able to just lay down and feed your baby. I don't have to get up. I don't have to make a bottle or, you know, formula is not sterile. So I don't have to boil water and, um, you know, have all of these steps to creating formula. It's right here on me. And I can just kind of relax, lay back and feed my baby. Okay. Um, and, you know, sometimes it does require work and it does require serious effort. With my two needs, the one of them when they were first born, latched right away. Actually, they didn't latch for the first three or four months. Okay. So mine took a lot of work. <laughs> I had to exclusively pump every two hours, um, you know, to get them the milk that they needed because they did not latch at first. Okay. Um, eventually with some work, they did end up latching and now we're going strong and steady. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I think if the will is there, it can typically happen. Okay. Well, I think maybe <laughs> um, for me, I, I think I was feeling overwhelmed and I just couldn't, mm -hmm. that I was very worried that I'm just not going to get this right. And I, I had heard about some of the other ladies learning and going through particular things that, that where they taught you to breastfeed and I had not done that. And so I just thought, well, it's too late. It's too late. I just got to mm -hmm use a bottle <laughs> um <laughs> and and you know something else important about breastfeeding you don't have to worry about what they put in the milk you know it's yeah <laughs> so that's powerful right there what you just said is powerful multiple um formula companies have been recalled right. um most on multiple occasions for whatever reason um, you don't have to worry about the fact that your milk is not sterile. So you have formula feeding mothers. They don't know or understand how to uh, prepare formula the proper way. There are steps to preparing formula. It's not as simple as opening the can and taking your scoops and putting it in the water and shaking it and giving it to the baby. Yeah. Formula is not sterile. There are steps to it. And I think that's a huge misconception. Um, so you know that's a big deal I, I completely understand being overwhelmed it's kind of like one more thing to learn and it's, especially when you have trouble um breastfeeding because like i said natural doesn't always mean easy you have mothers who they give birth and baby latches right away and it's just great and you have other mothers who deal with you know baby not latching tongue ties lip ties going undiagnosed um you have um sore nipples, um, amongst so many other things. Definitely understand that, but that's where lactation specialists, IBCOC, or lactation consultants come in to offer and aid you in getting baby to latch and um, showing you ways and steps to be successful. Now, um I yeah, I think I think all that you said is is extremely important, especially the the recall. 
But um, one thing you touched on is, is preparing the formula cor the correct way. And I remember hearing about people who didn't prepare correctly. And that means the baby's not going to get the nutrients that they need. And so the baby keeps showing up at the clinic, um, fa failing to thrive or something like that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I heard about that. A couple of people told me that that's what the doctor was saying. And I, I'm willing to bet it was because of the formula. I'm willing to bet because the baby looked okay to me, but you, I guess you never could tell. You'll definitely have some issues in that area um, with preparing formula, making sure to put the right increments, um, the right amount of scoops per water. Um, that can be an issue. Like I said, the actual formula is not sterile. So failing to boil water before you're uh, making bottles, you're just making bottles with water. You have, I've seen mothers use tap water <laughs> and just go ahead and add the formula in with no problem and shake it up and give it to the baby. You're potentially, potentially introducing different bacteria that are not good bacteria to the baby. Um, amongst other things that can create issues. So if you are formula feeding, it is important to know how to prepare formula correctly. Um, okay. Now, let's see, let's see. What I wanted to ask about, well, uh, as far as working with uh, a lactation specialist consultant, does, how do we find you? And does insurance cover the cost of that? as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lactation specialist, um, insurance may cover a portion or give reimbursement for a portion. For IBA CLCs, insurance does cover IBA CLCs typically. Um, for example, at my local hospital right now for an IBA CLC, I can go visit one for free at this moment. Um, I can just call and schedule an appointment with your local hospital. They typically have um, lactation area, um, and right now mine is free. But um, in other areas, I'm sure different areas are going to have different, different kind of different things. Um, they calling your local hospital, they could be free, or your local WIC office. Um, those services could be provided to you for free. Now, me as a lactation specialist, I do home visits. Um, those likely probably won't be covered by insurance, but they're pretty affordable per hour. And typically you only need an hour consultation or visit. I forgot. I think you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember good thing. Because I just uh, cussed, too, when I realized. <laughs> but um, it's important, too, that um, that something you said about it being affordable. And I, I did do a little bit of research, and I found out that the Affordable Act um, covers those insurance uh, companies. They do cover uh, for a lactation uh, specialist. And... Blue Cross Blue Shield, they cover, but I couldn't really find a lot other. So I'm guessing that for the most part, that is covered. Um, yeah, mostly it kind of varies and depends, but mostly the services can be covered. And I know it can be a little different from IBCOC, which is a board certified in, um, lactation, lactation um, consultant. So um, those services can vary a little bit and they typically can be covered. Typically, um, you can probably expect a reimbursement if you're working with like a lactation, lactation specialist who is doing like home visits and things of that such. Now, what did you say? What is it covered by? You said, is it? Okay, one more time. I'm sorry. What, you said that um, they were probably covered by, did you say IDOC or what is it? IBCLC. IBCLC. And what, what is that? That's a um, international board certified lactation consultant. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, that's a little bit different. That requires like a little bit more education. Um, that's, those are the ones that you would see typically working in the hospital. So now when you give birth, if you're planning to breastfeed, you'll get a visit from an IVCLC. 
who should ideally walk you through steps to breastfeed. That's kind of another issue that we face in the hospital, you know, people that look like us. Um, so, for example, using myself, when I had my son, I had to learn and do everything by myself. IBCLC walked in the room, passed me a breast pump, and walked out. She did not help me at all. Um, wow. And that's kind of the worst that you can do because, you know, unless you absolutely have to, you shouldn't be pumping before six weeks. Um, so, you know, in the event that you have to, like baby has a NICU stay, baby won't latch due to whatever reason, that's different. But if you don't have to and, and we can get baby to latch, that's the way that we want to go, you know? I think you're on mute again. So it's kind of like in a lot of my shows, I talk about our community. It's like we got to fight at every turn. We have to mm -hmm. fight at every single turn. And that's, that's a darn shame, but we have to be aware that this is how it is for us. And we have to keep pushing, mm -hmm. we have to stand up and keep advocating. And then in time, it will change. It will get better. But right mm -hmm. now, we got to do it. We have to speak up. Ask the people accountable. Yeah, Hold people accountable. Exactly. That makes it. Mm -hmm. And then you were saying, and then, and then they. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, you were, I cut you off. You were making a statement. You said, and then they something. Uh, when we were saying um, accountable. <laughs> I can't remember. And then they. <laughs> it's, it's, it's because it's a delay. It's, it's sort of a delay. Yeah. Yeah. So annoying. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> now again, I guess you decided that you want to be, that you wanted to become a certified lactation specialist because of your experience. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. or? Okay. Yes. Yes. I moved to, um, get my, um, I became a certified lactation specialist and I began like a Facebook group for, um, you know, moms locally around me, we're at about 200 members now, um, just so that moms can get, you know, the proper advice that they need quickly at any time of day or night. Because one thing that I do know about breastfeeding, you could give up in a second. One issue to where you just get frustrated and it's overnight and you can't access anybody for any advice, you're done. You're like, you know what, forget this. Let me go to the store really quick and grab a can because I'm tired. <laughs> And um, I wanted to kind of prevent that. I wanted to be that person that, you know, mothers could come to and um, just get the advice they needed because a lot of the times it's simple. It's simple stuff that can be corrected very quickly. Yeah. Just the, just the fact that you told me that <laughs> had I been thinking right, I would have realized, oh, this is so much more easy then having to get up, go boil water, boil the uh, bottles, because I did do that until I got tired. Mm -hmm. And so I had, I bought those um, disposable um, liners and it was, yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't know. And then I had other issues with the baby being gassy and it was probably mm -hmm. because of the bottle, you know, and all those things could be probably eliminated simply by mm -hmm. Yeah, I did not know that. So how did you, how long have you been a certified lactation specialist? I've been a certified lactation specialist for almost a year now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if somebody else wanted to go learn how to do this, what, what could they do? Where did they go? Like where, what's the qualifications and the training? They're actually, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can, um, I know that there are plenty of different, um, different um, companies that travel and offer um, the certifications. It kind of just depends on your Okay, it, it muted you for some reason. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, you should be able to kind of just look it up on Google. Um, Google your local agencies and see who you can kind of go through to become a certified specialist. You do not have to have any qualification. Okay. Everything will be offered to you through that program. So you don't have to have any, absolutely anything. Wow. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And I guess because it should be just regular moms, you know, who, who have come together to support each other. I think. I, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think I've asked quite a few questions. I think we've covered quite a lot. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do want to ask too. It, um, is did you say that the program? I think you're. I think you might have muted. Hold on one second. Let me check. Okay, no. go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm not muted. I I can see. <laughs> I can see that for sure. But um, is um, you said the program you just apply to it and everything that you need will be provided. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Everything you need is within the program. Typically, it's provided in your total cost of the class. The class is actually not super expensive. You, they offer scholarships typically for the classes um, to make it just a little bit more affordable. Typically, it just includes the essay, um, and you submit your essay, and they read it, and they tell you typically if you qualify or not. Okay. Now, how can um, how can people come to your Facebook group if they want to get support and advice with you? Um, you just would type in, I believe you just type in my link and the name of it is Breastfeeding Mothers of Fort Wayne and Surrounding Areas. Okay. Sorry, I had to walk back in the house really quick. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Um, I have two other panelists on the show, but they couldn't make this time, but that's great. We were able to do it anyway, in spite of really bad uh, attempts to get connected to Facebook Live. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and best of luck. Congratulations on the new baby. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. And for everybody watching the Shy Panther and Friends, thank you for supporting of the show. And we'll see you next time. Take care of yourselves and your family. God bless. All thank right. you. Okay, bye. Bye. -bye.